this is John Medved, and I'm here with a great webinar on a topic that I love, uh, together with uh, Jim Scheinemann and Krishna Modukuri. Uh, Jim is the uh, uh, founder and uh, general partner of Maven Ventures, which is a 11 or 12 year old uh, Silicon Valley seed fund, very well known and perhaps best known for uh, his early investment in Zoom, which we're all using now together with this uh, R crowd wonderful uh, uh, rapper. And uh, before that, uh, Jim uh, was active in uh, all kinds of sort of social media startups, actually going back to Bebo and Friendster days. Uh, he's a trained lawyer and uh, a very good friend of our crowd. We're delighted to have him to talk about the topic of how to build a hectacorn, which is a, a company of a hundred billion dollars in value. We're gonna look at this question through the lens of an analysis of one of his uh, uh, early uh, and new investments uh, in a company called Zippin, uh, with whose CEO is here with us and founder, Krishna Modakuri. Uh, and uh, we are now offering Zippin actually as an investment opportunity on our crowd and doing very, very well uh, mid campaign and, and it's everything's great. Krishna, by the way, uh, was at Naspers, which is a spectacular, huge, giant uh, uh, e-commerce and web company, internet company, uh, best known for their investment in Tencent. Uh, before that, he spent seven years at Amazon, which is a pretty good place to get trained for an e-commerce startup. And before that, he was in an area which is very, very close to my heart, which is comparison shopping. Since I was a backer of shopping.com, he was at Eugenie, and we're delighted to have Krishna and Jim with us. So I'm gonna turn it over to Krishna to give us a little context before we get into the topic of how do you pick a $100 billion company? So I want him to spend at least a few minutes introducing Zippin to the audience so that you can see what the company does and we can understand the question better through that lens. Krishna? Thank you, thank you, John. And thank you for having us uh, today. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, as uh, John mentioned, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Zipin. Um, we're building uh, checkout-free shopping for every retail store, right? In other words, Amazon Go-like experience and platform for every retail retailer out there. Um, what I'll do is actually show you a video that shows our technology in action. Uh, this is a store that recently launched in New York City, uh, in Barclays Center, actually, where the Brooklyn Nets play. Uh, Elisha, if you can play that video. Um, uh, just one second. Are you playing the video? Okay, yeah. So this is a store that's branded by American Express, and you can see customers can simply walk into the store by tapping their American Express card at the entrance or a mobile wallet that has an Amex card. They simply tap it in, go into the store, and they can take whatever they want. It could be snacks, beverages, hot food items like sandwiches, burgers, even backpacks, hats, you know, what you name it, right? And they can simply walk out. They don't have to wait in line anywhere. They don't have to scan anything. All they did was provide their card that's a valid card at the entrance, grab stuff and leave, right? And you can see a place like this, you know, half time gets, you know, very busy. Most, you know, stands out there take at least 10 to 15 minutes to get, get that stuff. So this is an incredible experience uh, that attracts more shoppers and also provides you know, very interesting economics for retailers. We've been very busy over the last few years taking this technology to a number of stores around the world. Today, we already have, uh, if you can switch to my slides, Elisheva, um, I'd like to talk about them. So we already have 43 stores like this already live or committed around the world, okay? We're in places, obviously we're in the US, uh, which is our largest market but also in places like Brazil, Europe, and Japan, where we're growing quickly. Um, and we have line of sight to over 100 Zippin powered stores before the end of this year, okay? And if you're curious what kinds of stores other than the one you just saw, we already support, we have a wide variety of locations we, our technology can support, it's pretty robust. We do residential markets that are powered by Zippin. This one's in Sao Paulo, launched about two years ago. Um, drink markets in stadiums that are exclusively for drinks and, and alcohol, for instance. Lounges like the one that you just saw, the Amex Lounge. 
uh, stores inside office buildings, right? So uh, an office building where people want to grab lunch quickly. This one's actually in the head office of Fujitsu, 4,000 employees, uh, gets very busy during breakfast and lunch times, right? And saves them a lot of time. Um, we are in uh, hotel lobbies. Like this is actually uh, a store in Yokohama uh, and also stores inside existing grocery stores, right? If a grocery store is not quite ready to invest in the technology in the entire store, they can convert a small section and make it an express section, right? And this express section can serve, uh, you know, customers that just want to grab an item and quickly leave in, in, a, in, a, in a few seconds. Uh, it could also be a 24 seven section of the, of the store, right? The rest of the store can close, but this section can stay open because it's very efficient to operate, okay? And also a quick look at the, the, the very large retailers we already work with. Um, so they are some of the largest you know, retailers in the world. Uh, Compass Foods is a $35 billion um, you know, uh, revenue company. Uh, they're our customer. Lawson's the number three convenience chain in Asia. They have 14,000 convenience stores. Uh, they're our customer, Aramark, and so on. So the, the list goes on. And this is not, a, it's not the full list. We actually uh, just recently signed a, a top five retailer in the world uh, that's piloting our technology already. The reason why retailers get excited, you know, obviously every retailer wants an amazing shopping experience for their shoppers, right? Um, but there are other reasons behind the scenes as well. Uh, this shows you, you know, with this stadium store that we talked about, we showed this one attracted thousand shoppers in just four hours, like an amazing amount of throughput that, that the store saw. In fact, the state, the, the president of the stadium said this was the, the a venue record for them. They've never seen that level of transaction throughput. Um, it was just a 440 square foot store that did this much traffic. And if you looked at the transaction capacity and, and, and uh, scale it up, you would see that this would translate to $75,000 a year in sales per square foot, okay? Most stores would do around $1,000 a square foot. So just see the, the expansion and capacity that we're able to provide. And um, they were able to do A-B tests on the store. And they said, what is the customer willingness? It, it sounds commonsensical that customers would prefer a store without lines, but they wanted to quantify it. So they had a store exactly the same size on the other side of the stadium, but it had self-checkout. And they were able to establish that customers preferred this store and shopped 30% higher in a zip and power store than in a self-checkout store. So by eliminating lines, you actually get more customers to walk in and you earn more share of wallet from them, okay? Of course, labor cost savings are significantly lower. The only, only thing that was needed here was somebody that needed to check ID. There's no other labor cost needed, no cashiers needed. And of course, the customer experience was 10 times better, right? We clock this thing, the time it takes from, from the time they scan in at the entrance, walk around, go grab their two beers or whatever, and then walk out. The average was 45 seconds compared to five plus minutes elsewhere, right? And so that's why, you know, our retailers love us. And this is um, Alison Birdwell, who's the president of uh, sports and entertainment at Airmark. Uh, she said, Zippin is the way of the future, not just in the stadium environment, pretty much everywhere. Okay. So thank you, Krishna, for that opening. Uh, before I get to Jim, though, we've had two quick questions, which I think we should probably deal with before we move forward, which is it, how do you compare to Amazon Go and to standard cognition? That's a good, good question. So um, let me explain, basically, the experience that you are seeing is very similar to Amazon Go, okay? And we use a very similar approach called multimodal AI uh, to, um, to build our technology. The main difference between us and Amazon is that our cost of hardware is significantly lower because we used commodity hardware produced by NVIDIA uh, and uh, Google, uh, Google TPU and commodity cameras. Uh, Amazon has chosen to build their own technology in-house, uh, primarily because of the time they started this, right? So most of our customers um, that have been approached by Amazon say that we are on the average 50% uh, lower cost, okay, than Amazon. And we are significantly more flexible in terms of APIs and integrations. We support four different payment methods to walk in. For example, Amex card only. Amazon has other restrictions around, you have to use Amazon Pay uh, in order to use their technology. Okay. Great. Now, compared to other startups, uh, I do want to actually 
uh, I have a slide that I can use to show the difference between us and others, right? Uh, this is just a quick comparison of where we stand with the rest of the competitors in this space. Um, we had 12 stores live, and this is like end of Jan, we're talking about 12 stores live and eight customers announced. Standard Cognition had only four stores launched and four customers announced. And that's because we knew how to build it right from day one, okay? We knew that high accuracy and low cost would be crucial given that retail net margins are low. Computer vision, everybody is very happy when they reach an 80%, 90% accuracy, right? In the, in the lab space, that's great. In academia, that's great. But in retail, anything less than 98% means you're wiping out that entire net profit. They have net profits of two to 3%, okay? And we knew that multimodal AI is the only approach that delivers that greater than 99% accuracy. So we built technology that combines ceiling cameras that are using computer vision with sensors on the shelf that are a completely different source of ground truth for us, right? And Zipin and Amazon were the only ones who took that bet early on and built the technology that way. So that's why we are the only ones that have the very high accuracy solution. Most of our competitors, including Standard Cognition, chose to build something with only ceiling cameras. And so that's why they're stuck at 90% accuracy. It's very difficult, right? And it should be pretty obvious. Most large products, you know, you can actually recognize using ceiling cameras. There's nothing you know, difficult about that. And it should be pretty obvious also that for very small products, it's almost impossible to do it only with ceiling cameras because human hands are the, the physical limitation, right? So if I pick products like this, you wouldn't know if I, how many candy items I picked, how many uh, lipstick items I picked, right? And so, so those are the, the two extremes that most people agree on. And everything in the middle to do it with cameras only is still a huge, huge challenge, right? And so that's one area where, you know, we can talk about this more later, but- Yeah, and I, I, think we're, I, I think, Krishna, we're gonna, we're gonna come back to this and that we've seen a bunch of questions, by the way, this is a very lively bunch on this yes. uh, webinar. I wanna encourage you to keep those questions flowing. We will get to them, but I wanna bring Jim into the conversation. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, Jim was an early investor in Zoom, which today, I haven't checked today's stock price, but it's something in the $110 billion range. I don't know. First of all, Jim, do you check that stock price every day? I try not to check it every day, but um, you know, <laughs> I do often. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Jim is, is known for actually having given Zoom its name and congrats on that. It's a, a, as, a, as a Zoombie, I am very, very you know, happy with the name and uh, uh, love it or a Zoomer. I don't know what you guys call people who use uh, Zoom. Yeah. But the, uh, did you know, right? When you, when you, you know, wrote the check, uh, how did you feel? How big was your initial sort of thesis when you went to your you know, investment committee and your partners and made the investment or, you know, what was your thought about what it was going to end up? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about Zoom. I just, let me, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm always thrilled to talk about Zipin and be here with Krishna and with you. And we're delighted to work with our crowd uh, on, on this round um, and with Zipin. Um, I do want to mention one other thing, that the, the question about Amazon Go, and it kind of ties into you know, one of the reasons why we were excited about doing this, this deal and how I also thought about Zoom early on. Um, that you know, Krishna sort of hinted at, but I want to just kind of really hammer home to some of the questions were about this. Um, you look, you know, a lot of the large companies out there that need Zip in as their solution are not going to work with Amazon. You have to understand that. Like sometimes people get worried about investing in a new company like Zoom when there's Skype and Microsoft out there and Cisco WebEx. Like game over. This is you know massive companies in the marketplace, and the reality is many of those companies, especially when they're doing new technologies are not going to be successful. I'm not saying that's the case with Amazon, but you have to understand that most of the companies that Zipin's working with and will be working with would never ever work with Amazon. They can, it's too threatening. There's a reason why all these retailers are scrambling around and, and begging Zipin to work with them, right? Because they need the solution and they can't work with Amazon, they won't. So I just want to put that out there. I mean, there was a bunch of questions about the business model that Krishna will definitely get to. Get, we'll but get to those to later, but, yeah. but, but, but yeah, how, how big did you think yeah. Zoom was going to be? And I'm bringing no, this listen, back to Zipin right away. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, so the way that we invest at Maven is every company we invest in, we think is going to be a multi-billion dollar company. If we don't see that market opportunity, or in this case now, I guess today we'll say, you know, multi tens of billion or hundred billion dollar company. 
Um, if we don't see that market opportunity, we won't invest. We sometimes meet incredible founders with what we call a great vision worth fighting for, a great you know, product and great idea. But frankly, there's just no way it's going to end up being a billion dollar company or it's going to be so hard to get to that scale. So I would just say that as a baseline, every one of Maven's investments is, is you know, that's our thought. Now, do, do we ever know, like, this is the one that's going to be the, the $100 billion company? Look, when we did Zoom, you know, again, you have to remember the marketplace. Um, you know, this was uh, about nine years ago, right? And Skype was sort of dominant in the, in the social uh, consumer space. And um, you, of course, you know, Cisco WebEx and a couple of other large companies out there. One of the things that I knew um, was that those products were just not that good. I mean, they were solving a really, really big problem. We all knew that this was going to be something that was going to be integral to how we live and work. Obviously, you know, with the pandemic, it accelerated that about 20 years. Um, but, you know, we knew that back then, 10 years ago, like that was clear. We had done another company called Tango, which was one of the first um, consumer focused, focusing uh, video application, and it grew to about 300 million people. I knew that this market was going to be massive. And when I met with Eric and Zoom and, and he told me about his idea of basically, you know, where he came from, WebEx, he was the head of engineering and product, and he was so embarrassed about the quality of that product. He had to leave and start over again. That spoke to me and I got it. And, and, and so and then were you, were you yeah. worried about competition? I mean, what's interesting is that there are so many questions here about competition where people are yeah. worried about Amazon doing this. Does Amazon sure. have patents? Does, is Amazon going to, you know, stomp yeah. on this? I mean, do you think about, I mean, you, and you invested in Zoom, as you mentioned, it was Cisco, Microsoft. I mean, the biggest companies in the world were your competitors and they all had products in the market. You know, um, yeah. You know, did that bother you? I mean, look, we're, of course, we, you know, it's some, sometimes it's very concerning. Um, and you have to really believe that, that this is the right team that's going to build the right product and has, has a possibility of actually taking away a huge chunk of market share or creating a new op opportunity. And so with Zoom, and I think this applies also to Zipin, is yes, we, you know, great team. And when I, I got it luckily uh, introduced to Krishna and Moti through a, a former um, Maven founder who I, he and I built a company that we sold to Google it was a huge exit. And, and when he told me, you have to meet Krishna, he's one of the smartest guys I ever worked with at Amazon. And he's got this great idea to build this um, check free, you know, uh, shopping experience. I, I got it. One of the things, by the way, that we care deeply about in addition to the highly technical, amazing founders like Krishna and Moti is the vision we're fighting for, right? And so we looked at this and I thought instantly, I hate missing any, you know, part of a sporting event. I go to a lot of sporting events. And when you have to miss a quarter of a basketball game because you have to wait in line for a beer and a hot dog, or, you know, it's just that should never, ever happen again. I hate, I'm, you know, I'm a pretty patient guy, but waiting in line for, you know, in, in a safe way or shopping for food, that should never happen. If you pick that wrong line, you're there for 15 minutes when you could have gone the other one. That, that will never happen again, thanks to Zippin. That spoke to me personally. I understood that. Then the only question is, can this team build this, right? And can we scale it? And how quickly will it happen? And, well, I, and I saw way, all those pieces is, like it would do with Zoom. That, that's very interesting because you're mentioning, I want to ask Krishna. I mean, one of the things that struck me when I saw this company, uh, and I was you know, quite aware of the competition and full disclosure, competition, in my opinion, is always a good thing in an investment thesis, okay? Better to invest in a big, exciting market behind what you think is the winning team, you know, when there's no competition, then get worried, okay? You know, don't, don't be in, in the, these stages of a company. So you look for traction. And this okay. company, you have 43 stores already committed or live, and you've raised to date a total of only $15 million. And these are happening all over the world. How do you do that? What are you, are, you, are your people volunteering? I don't understand. So it's a good point. Um, so let me let me start by just talking a little bit about my background, right? So I'm in my mid forties. Um, I've, I've obviously worked at Amazon and Aspers before. As part of Aspers, I ran two businesses as CEO, was a portfolio CEO, and I did another startup before, which gave me enough opportunities to make mistakes and learn from, right? Um, so I, I had a particular way I wanted to build this company. Right? I knew this was going to be one of the biggest opportunities. I worked in e-commerce for 20 years. And I saw how e-commerce went from mid-90s to you know 2015-ish time, right? 
And I, I wanted to work in an area that would be as big in the next 20 years. It's computer vision, it's AI, it's AI driven transformation of businesses, right? So I, I wanted to take my time to build the right tech, to find the right customers and raise money at the right time, at the right intervals to match the growth, okay? So we patiently built the tech from 2015 all the way up to 2018, tested the tech multiple times, look for all kinds of edge cases. You know, it's, it's not just trying, people trying to trick the system, but also like, you know, naturally shopping people could make mistakes and you don't want retailers to take a hit for that, right? So we built all that stuff in 2018, we raised our, uh, raised our first seed round, okay? And then we again, patiently built the tech, further improved it, got the right customers and raised our series A. Now, what I'm explaining is that basically because we took our time to build it the right way, we are able to actually do things many of our you know, competitors that have raised a lot of money are not able to do because if you, if you put money in the wrong direction, it's not likely going to pay off, right? And so that's what you're seeing in the results right now. With a smaller team, we're approaching about 100 people now, but you know, we were about 50 people earlier. And we actually were able to launch stores for large retailers in the US, Brazil, Moscow, Japan, by actually not having to physically be present in every one of those areas. We built all the necessary tools uh, that could be used to actually uh, do this effectively, okay? Now, I just wanna add one more thing on, on competition. Uh, you're absolutely right, John. I think, you know, having done this multiple times, I know the biggest threat for startups is nobody caring, right? Competition is actually great to have, you know, competition validates. And especially in this case, having a, a, a really large, well-respected player taking bets in this space is actually a net positive for us, right? So our sales to the retailers are much more, if much quicker because, you know, they already know that this is happening. You know, this future is going to be brought forward by companies like Amazon and they need to work with companies like Zipin to actually get there, you know, in time. So um, one of the questions that uh, was asked earlier was about the business model That's and right. how you sell. Uh, and, and there's another question that came in in terms of implementation costs and whatnot. I was taken by your unique business model. Can you share a little bit about that? John, you know, I just, before you get into that, Chris, I just want to follow up on one thing, because there is a connection here with, it reminds me a lot, and a lot of people don't remember this or know this, in the early days of Zoom, it's kind of hard to believe, uh, we went up and down for series A, B, and C, up and down the valley, and nobody wanted to invest, you know, um, in, in large part because the VCs didn't see the vision, in large part because it was competition, and 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 it's it really reminds me exactly what Krishna is doing with what Eric Yuan, the founder CEO of Zoom, who's also highly technical, did. Small team raised just enough money to, to to actually focus on the product and deliver an amazing product that kept their customers happy. And this is exactly what Zipin is doing. And then at some point, by the way, I made the intro to Sequoia, a very famous VC firm, in the A round. They kept in touch and ended up doing the Series D round. When they could have done it at a you know thirty million dollar valuation, they end up doing it at a billion dollar valuation, a hundred million dollar investment, and that's what happens with companies like Zipin and Zoom is that they eventually see the vision and how this huge market opportunity is now developing. And in this line of work that we're doing with Zipin, the cash flows are a little bit delayed because of the way that this retail business works. The the kind of deals that we're closing now in the next twelve to eighteen months, we're going to have massive cash flow, right? And that's the same thing with Zoom. It wasn't. A lot of cash flow at that time. We had to see that promise of where it was going. So I'm kind of teeing you up for the business model, Krishna. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to do was actually, in addition to frictionless shopping, we also wanted to have a frictionless business model, right? Uh, we knew that um, building the AI is just only like half of the the, the biggest challenge here, right? The other half is actually bringing that AI, you know, cost effectively to the physical world, um, deploying cameras, sensors, understanding cabling, wiring, and so on, right? So we invested quite heavily in that, but we also went one step further and adopted a subscription business model. So for retailers, we are pretty confident they get very, you know, uh, quick uh, return on their investment, okay? Uh, but we wanted to make it almost a no-brainer. So we charge a single monthly fee for hardware, software, installation, and maintenance, right? So pretty much most retailers would see a positive ROI from day one 
when they sign with Zipin because they know how much they can save in labor costs, how much increase in traffic they can see, and you know what are they paying uh, for Zipin? I think with no you know hidden charges anywhere. So I mean, and you were talking about seventy five thousand dollars per square foot in terms of uh, performance compared to what is standard. Yeah, so I mean that is just the transaction capacity. I don't want uh, people to um, to get confused. So, so I'll give you an example of what a good, a very high performing uh, grocery store in the U.S. Um, I won't name them, but they're one of the. They're not the biggest, but they're they're, they're you know pretty popular. They do about one thousand seven hundred dollars in annual sales per square foot. Okay, and people actually tested when Amazon Go first launched that by eliminating lines and transacting capacity, they can increase that by 50%, right? So you could actually do $2,600, dollars per, per, sales, per sales, you know, sales per square foot, okay? And so that's a big, of course, the, the sky is the limit, you know, the technology can support up to $75,000, right? Um, but what you would see is that share of wallet goes up by about 50%, right? So that's a big driver for ROI. Do you have, do you have any data that you can share with us so far in terms of what people are, are seeing? Yeah, so I mean, the, the stadium use case is a perfect example, right? So this is a, a real estate that is highly valued for those few hours, right? There are lots of people walking by and it's a well-known fact that you're, you're not gonna get that additional beer if you don't get it up front, you're, you're not gonna get it later, right? And because you don't wanna go back and stand in line, you, may, you forgot something, you don't do it. And people had done surveys for a very long time to, add, you know, to find out how much you know, people would actually buy if they didn't have lines at all, right? Uh, and they ex estimated anywhere between 50 to 70%, right? And the first test that was done, this is a very, you know, a four day test, AB test, we already showed that the sales were 30% higher for a um, Zipin powered store versus a store, a traditional store that actually has lines, right? Because self-checkout has lines, okay? Um, and that essentially customers feeling like, okay, they've got their own personal refrigerator, personal pantry, there's no friction, so they can actually walk in anytime they want and then they end up, uh, you know, buying more. It, it, it's really uh, remarkable. Now, one of the people has been asking a lot about patents and about yes. IP and, you know, they're surprised that uh, Amazon, you know, didn't file business methods on Amazon Go and, and, and whatnot. Um, are you worried at all about the patent or IP situation? How would you describe it? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Jim said it right, <laughs> which is, you know, uh, when Zoom started, I'm sure the video conferencing space was patented out like hell, right? Yes. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I don't think necessarily for any startup in this space, patents are um, major deterrent because we have built the technology ourselves, right? And you can you know, build layers and layers and go back all the way to you know, different things people have been thinking about for a very long time. Uh, so in general, you know, there's not a whole lot I can comment on, but we are patenting many unique things ourselves, like, because this is a vast space that this, we're just at the beginning of you know, what we're building here in terms of technology. You will see a tons of patents coming from all kinds of different players that are about various aspects of this tech. And, and um, Jim, you know, one of the things that is interesting to me is, is uh, trajectory of growth, right? And obviously, you know, uh, Krishna and his team are growing very fast, as did uh, Zoom. And then all of a sudden, you know, when, when I remember when Zoom went, you know, went public, it was valued initially at a couple of billion dollars. And then, boom, how many years has it been since that public offering? Uh, it's like year and a half, year and a half. And now it's at 110. I mean, yeah. how, how, you know, what kind of growth rate do you think is sustainable? And, and, you know, I mean, Krishna is growing at a wild pace, right? In other words, 43 yeah. stores committed a hundred by the end of the year. I, yeah. I didn't ask him what his plan is, you know, for next year in terms of how many hundreds more, you know, right. uh, um, yeah. Is is hundred percent growth year to year sustainable? Two hundred percent? What 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 is possible in these kinds sure. of big growth? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, yeah, you know, the first thing I understand is that this is a trillion. Just like Zoom, we had another company that recently filed to go public in a different space called Embark. It's a self driving trucks company. So you know, 
truck industry is a trillion dollar market opportunity. The retail industry worldwide, globally, a trillion dollar industry. These are massive, massive industries, right? So sustainable growth for a very long time is definitely achievable and will happen uh, with us executing, right? It really comes down to us executing. One of the interesting things that we've learned uh, that's fascinating is that because we're actually out there, like Krishna said, mo much more so than anyone in the market, uh, we're seeing unique things. Like once we get into a stadium, and they do a test store and they realize this is amazing. We're doing more revenue per square foot with less people. And most importantly, our consumers love this. They'll keep coming back to these games and events. We need to have 50 of these stores in the stadium, right? So there's this really interesting land expand, you know, uh, opportunity um, that is, is a growth strategy that's sustainable for a very long time, in addition to the massive grocery chains and all the other you know, airport opportunities we have. So I think it's there. I think it's um, going to happen. We see it already. It's one of the reasons why we're raising this pretty big round is to sustain um, and continue to be the leader in the live stores out there in the marketplace. And, and the, um, the, the cost for a, an operator of the store monthly for your all-in you know, uh, in Hebrew, they call it kol kalul, everything included, which, by the way, is very popular in our country, Israel, probably popular a lot of places. You know, you get maintenance, installation, software, hardware, everything, training all at once. That's amazing. What, what are the prices run for these kinds of stores that we're looking at? So the pricing itself depends on uh, two major factors. It's the size of the store, right? Uh, obviously, the larger the store, you know, more hardware, so the price cost can be higher. Uh, and the second is actually the traffic, the store seats, right? So a store that's like in a residential market doesn't get a lot of traffic. It's going to be lower priced than let's say stadium store that's that has very high capacity. Um, the the prices range, you know, again for for smaller stores that you're seeing now. Uh, they are usually in the several thousand dollars a month. Okay, uh, again, it's be, be, it'd be difficult to get into the specific details. Now, but that, they, the people, if they're really interested, can contact us, and we'll be happy to put you exactly. in, uh, yeah. in in touch. I mean, another thing which people are asking, which clearly needs to be answered, is it? Uh, they're asking if the, do customers need apps, and the answer is no way, right? In other words, basically, flash your credit card or your you know, mobile pay option and exactly. grab, you know, uh, zip in, in and zip out. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So vast majority of our stores, um, it's, it is truly, truly frictionless. Like you don't even have to download an app. You can simply take your credit card, insert it, tap it, mobile wallet, whatever you already have, just walk out. Of course, there are some retailers that, that would see the benefit of actually um, adding an app-based option because that you know, that way you can actually add loyalty points and other things, right? So you're checking in, uh, maybe enhance the experience as well. Just imagine with an app, you can do things like real-time navigation within the store, right? Because our system is actually a real-time GPS in the store. We know exactly where everybody is all the time. So literally, if somebody says, hey, I, I need to find this item, we can give them turn-by-turn -turn directions, not just like go to aisle number five. We can tell them, walk around, you know, take five steps, take a ride, you'll find it there, right? Uh, so a lot of interesting things that'll come later, but for now, you know- but, And Krishna, you should talk a little bit about some of the personalization, some of the things that, you know, we're hearing from the marketing executives at the, uh, either the stadiums themselves or, you know, the places that we're working with or those middlemen that we're working with to get into those places. Th this is like nirvana for a lot of these um, stadium owners and team owners, right? That they can actually say to a certain section of this uh, stadium, hey, between innings two and three or in halftime, there's 50% off hot dogs and beer, right? Like if they want to generate, or they can actually have partnerships. You know, one of the things that's interesting is Amex was really excited to work with, with Zipin because, you know, they can actually start pushing product and testing on an individual basis or by, you know, gender base. It's really interesting, like demographic basis. One of the ideas that we had, um, I don't know if we can announce the, the, in the tennis uh, tournament in uh, New York coming up. Yeah, there are there are definitely a number of initiatives that unfortunately we can't get into because it's <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. One, one of the things that but what we can do in general with someone like Amex, for example, right? You can have a nice little section that's exclusive for Amex Platinum holders. Exactly. And by the way, that could be an incentive for people to upgrade. What I'm what I'm mentioning are some of these business ideas 
that you couldn't even think of unless you're actually executing and doing that's where you're selling the discount cristal champagne that you know take back to your box (laughs) exactly they they, i think they just order it to the box anyway but um, (laughs) you know it's interesting krishna and jim you guys are focusing on small uh stores okay clearly you know whether it's airports stadiums you know, as you mentioned, condo facilities, store in store, office buildings, that wonderful slide you shared before. Um, why did you choose that strategy rather than, you know, some of the others who seem to be going after the big supermarkets? Okay. So Alicia, if you, if you can switch over to my slides again, I just want to show one slide um, that'll explain that very clearly, right? So obviously, uh, you know, when we first started looking at the way we wanted to go to market, and it was very important for us um, that, you know, both for technology as well as pushing the uh, envelope forward, we wanted real live stores today. Like we wanted actually stores being used by customers the way, you know, frictionless experience is supposed to be done, what you've seen at Amazon Go stores, right? And we segmented the market, right? We looked at quick serve, which is a small format stores, convenience stores, and grocery stores. Okay. And we analyzed and we found that all three of them, all three of those segments are actually fairly large in the total market size, right? Several hundred billion dollars. By quick serve, I mean fast food restaurants, airport grab and go mm-hmm. stores, stadium concession stands, and so on. You will see that in the quick serve segment, the experience of the customer is they only take about a half a minute to decide what, I mean, there's not a whole lot to decide. You know, you're getting a sandwich or, you know, you know, you want to cook, whatever. Uh, but then you end up spending five minutes waiting in line, right? So when you eliminate the line, the user experience is 10x better, right? Uh, in convenience, you know, we, we have data that shows it's about one to one, like 63 seconds is the is the time to wait in line and 71 seconds to, to decide and shop. And then in grocery, it's actually the other way around. People actually spend 30, 40 minutes shopping. Yes, the lines are long and, and it's frustrating, but it's usually about seven, five to seven minutes, which is a much smaller portion, right? So what we found was that by eliminating lines in quick serve, you get much more willingness to try a new experience. Okay, so customers are more willing to try something new in quick serve than in other, other segments. So that was one. And the second one we also learned was that the net profit increase is higher in quick serve than in convenience and grocery. And that's because almost everybody saves money on labor costs, right? That, that part is obvious to people. You don't have, you have fewer cashiers, but in quick serve, these places are actually in high real estate cost areas. They are paying a lot for rent because they get a lot of traffic, a lot of food traffic passing by. And with Zipin, they're able to bring in more sales, more food traffic coming in. So they see a benefit, not just labor cost savings, but they see a much larger benefit in terms of additional sales they can drive. So that is the reason why we, put, we chose QuickServe as the first segment to focus on. And I wanna clarify that we're not saying that this is the only thing we're doing. We are taking everything we're building in QuickServe and going to convenience. Our very first full full size convenience store is expected to launch later this year. Okay. Great. Uh, um, Jim, I'm going to ask you a question. When when you looked mm-hmm. at this and you did an analysis of the risk factors, like what could go wrong? Uh, you know, there's some BCs who focus a lot on that. Others don't. Okay. I don't know, really know about your style on on this. You know, what were the the major risk factors? Uh, I imagine many of them have been eliminated, such as, you know, making this work and proving that it, that, that it actually can play in the real world. And that's a huge advantage for Zippin because all these other guys are still doing POCs. Mm-hmm. Zippin's mm-hmm. got operational stores in dozens of them, you know, uh, working and, and, and committed. Um, but uh, what, what were some of the risk factors that you, you know, sort of zoom, zipped in on Okay, and, and, and thought need to be overcome. Sure. Um, yeah, we, we think a lot about the risk factors. You know, we, we'll meet thousands of companies a year and do six or seven investments. And, uh, you know, the reasons we get to know a lot of the time is because either it's just not the right technical team that's going to be able to execute. We just don't believe it. Or there may be founder issues. But obviously, we didn't see that there. Um, it might not be a vision worth fighting for, you know, something we're not proud of bringing to the world. Clearly, that you know, it wasn't the case here with Zip in. It may not be a trillion dollar, billion dollar market opportunity. That is actually one of the most common. It's like great team, great product, but it's like a small company. It's, you know, we need massive returns in our line of work. 
Um, not the case here. But I will tell you the story, actually, when I met Krishna, um, we did not invest right away. Krishna will know, you know, um, and we often do this. About half of our investments, we kind of give homework to our founders to get to know them. You know, we, didn't, we knew Krishna very well through his uh, mutual friend, who I know very well, but I didn't know Krishna well yet. And one of the things, you know, Krishna showed me the deck and the vision. I met him, Moti. What I was so impressed is he, had a t- he did a tiny friends and family round, quit his job, did this because he was so passionate about it. One of the things we care about is he was deeply passionate and persistent to make this come to the, you know, when you're doing a new company like Zip and bringing something new to the world, you have to have that passion and persistence. So we saw that. And they actually built their own little Zip in store in this tiny little office space uh, in San Mateo, which we went to visit. And I was blown away. I, I hadn't seen, I knew Amazon Go was coming out, but I hadn't seen the technology and it worked. I was like, okay, if two guys with a little bit of money could do this, imagine what a team with a, you know, a lot more money can do. I said, the one risk factor, Krishna, that we, the reason we can't invest in your seed round and lead it right now is the time. This is the hardest thing for us to judge. Like we knew this was the right team, the right technology, the right vision worth fighting for. We just didn't know when. We knew Amazon Go is like a lot of rumors about it, but was it going to be a year from now or five years from now? If it's five or 10 years from now, it's too far in the future. We can't invest to keep you alive long enough. So we, I said, you know, do the best you can, stay alive, and let's check in in six months or nine months or whenever Amazon Go launches. And about nine months later, Krishna get, reaches back out to me. He's like, okay, Amazon Go, you can go and see the store in about six months. Now's the time. And I was like, you're absolutely right. And that's when we led that round. When, when we got, we de-risked the timing, that was huge. It, it seems as though, by the way, um, and I'd love to hear Krishna and Jim's thoughts on this, that COVID has been very good to this company, okay? Uh, like it has in general for, you know, overall digital transformation. But, it, it, you know, for Zoom, obviously, COVID had, you know, sort of a, a rather important impact. Um, but here too, you know, given the fact that people are a little bit, you know, uh, agrophobe, you know, people don't like being in, in spaces uh, that are confined. They don't want to be around people. They don't like lines. They don't like, you know, contactless. Everything is the wave of the future. I mean, how do you look at this, Krishna? I mean, has COVID really accelerated this business? Yeah, I mean, cer- most certainly, right? So I think um, before the COVID, our conversations with customers were, uh, retailers mainly, were around frictionless technology efficiency, which were very important things, you know, and, and they were watching Amazon do these things anyway. But then with COVID, they added another huge dimension to it, contactless. And when they realized that our technology, by definition, is not just frictionless, it's also contactless, they knew that they could actually kill two birds with one stone, right? So that accelerated interest in the tech. And there was one other thing which was, uh, which, you know, the, the customers, the, so the end shoppers were asking for contactless, right? There were some like, you know, remnant questions around, okay, how do you accept cash in the store, right? You know, like we said, we can, we can handle that, but there's a little bit more friction there. And now they don't even ask that because they know that most shoppers actually are perfectly fine at adopting a new technology and adapting to a new world uh, without any problems, right? So, so that has helped us a lot. You know, an, another question is about um, cybersecurity, hacking, uh, fraud, theft. I mean, uh, you know, are there people really trying to sort of hack into the system or beat the system or test you? You know, can they? I mean, it was, one of the things I remember hearing was that you're actually cutting fraud and theft dramatically in sure. stores. Can you address that a little bit? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So the, the experience is that shoppers are providing a valid payment method at the entrance. And that's the time when the gates open and the customers can walk, shoppers can walk into the store, shop, right? Uh, anything they take off of the shelf, no matter how they take it, right? Even if they're trying to hide it, they're, they're putting it in their pocket, doesn't matter. If it's taken off of a shelf, it has to be accounted for. Our system will account for it and it'll assign it to them. They've already provided the payment method, it's gonna get charged, okay? So shoplifting is practically impossible, okay? Now people ask the question around like, you know, tricking the system, all of those things. You take a product from one, you know, shelf, 
you know, walk around, change your mind, drop it somewhere else, like pick something. All of those natural cases in shopping are already handled by our system, okay? Now, obviously there are some complex cases, like if you if you bring like a giant golf umbrella and walk into the store, <laughs> blocking all the cameras, I mean, those are like blatant, you know, like grab and go, like sorry, smash and grab type approaches. Uh, we will raise an alarm, you know, the customer is under heavy surveillance, right? So there's enough deterrence there. So it hasn't, you know, that hasn't been an issue at all. And in terms of hacking, I just want to, again, add one more thing, which is we built this system knowing that privacy would be a top consideration for anybody involved, right? Whether the shoppers who are shopping in the store or retailers that are making a, a purchase decision, they want to make sure that this solution is privacy friendly, right? So the way we built this, and you may have, uh, we'll share some videos later, the cameras are actually overhead looking straight down. So they're not actually looking at people's faces. They're not using any facial recognition, which is why during the pandemic, like we made a very you know easy transition, like people were wearing masks and stuff, like we didn't have any problem. We track people like dots on a map. And uh, so, and we are very, very you know careful about uh, you know, data privacy, data security. So even if somebody does hack into the system, which is very difficult, they won't find anything valuable that they can tie back to the, to the customer, okay? That's great. Um, one of the questions we've got is um, about productivity uh, improvements and what you've learned from your trials and pilots, okay? I mean, have there been sort of interesting findings that you could share that have yeah. come up that you hadn't expected, but you're now seeing as a result of the rubber meeting the road, as it were. Yeah, so I think there are some some incredible uh, you know observations we were able to make. Um, first, uh, we realized that the 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 demand elasticity, right, which is demand spikes that you see in stores, are one of the biggest you know uh, drivers of cost for retailers. They almost have to plan ahead of time and have X number of cashiers hired for that peak that, that could come for an hour's time, okay? Unfortunately, they have to hire these people for eight hour shifts, right? And so you've got three people hired to meet the demand in that one hour. And then like, you know, the rest seven hours, like two of them are just milling around and you're trying to find some other work for them, okay? So by having a solution like ours, that's, you know, completely elastic, uh, significantly, like even more than what we originally assumed, it, it significantly improves their um, uh, labor costs. The second thing we learned was that inventory tracking is uh, almost as important a, a you know uh, a function for retailers as just the checkout and the and the shopping experience. Our technology works by tracking every product on every shelf all the time, right? So which pro which shelf is running low, we can predict that you know pretty much in real time. Uh, reducing the total number of out of stocks, which is a driver of you know uh, sales for customers. Like if you have a product that's not on stock, then it won't sell, right? So you're losing revenue, and so you reduce the number of out of stocks. Customers take a product and put it on the wrong shelf. That's actually considered a problem by retailer, right? Uh, because that product that's sitting on the wrong shelf is not going to sell as effectively. So they have to you know send people down the store looking for all the places where those wrong products are sitting in order to drive sales we actually eliminate that need because we know exactly which shelves have the wrong products. So that person can actually just find those things in like five minutes. And so huge productivity improvement in, in areas like that, that, that we hadn't originally imagined. I think we're going to uh, approach the wind up here in just a few minutes. I, I want to make two, uh, Jimmy, do you want to say something here? Uh, I, you know, I just wanted to, you know, mention, I love the story, Christian, you, you're telling um, one of the stories, it was the Barclay Center story, I think, uh, Think, so because this is such a brand new idea, we're learning every single time we do a new store. In that store, they actually decided they're going to put, you know, jerseys and basketballs, items. Normally, we sell $5, 10 $15 items, $2 items. They put in $100 items. And we were, I mean, we were surprised. We saw people buying these kinds of items. I don't know if you ever go to a, a, a sports game. You see the line in the team store. Like, it's ridiculous. People leave because they, I want to get a t-shirt. I want to associate, I want to spend $150 on a jersey. I want to show that I love this team, but there's such a huge line. I'm not going to do it. That will never, ever happen again, thanks to Zipin, right? Well, speaking, and teams love this. Speaking of, uh, we love it too. And in fact, we've been asked a question, uh, which I'm going to answer myself, which is that if you invest 
uh, through our crowd in Zippin. Do you get a Zippin t-shirt? And the answer is yes. We are yes. going to send Thank out you. a Zippin t-shirt to everybody. We'll talk about it. I don't. I see two kinds now. I see the orange, you know, and I see the the the, the blue with the orange letters. We'll figure it out. We're going to get a T-shirt to everybody who invests. We're being asked one other last question here about um, there was some kind of a shutdown of the showcase store in San Francisco. What was the reason for the same? If you could describe that. Yeah. So this was uh, this is a good story. I did actually post something on our blog explaining the uh, the, the the origin of that story, uh, the the store itself. Uh, so this is a store in San Francisco downtown, uh, just a block away from Salesforce Tower. Very premium real estate, uh, obviously pretty pretty high rent as well. Uh, we wanted to actually get a store up and running in San Francisco before Amazon would launch their store because we knew it was going to be important for customers to believe that this technology is actually working and it, it can be built by companies other than Amazon, right? Because until then it was like only Amazon has it, it costs like billions to build, you know, the store itself is extremely expensive. And so we wanted to actually just prove it beyond doubt, right? Um, and so we signed this space for a three-year lease we got the store set up and it did amazingly well for us. We got a lot of showcases done. We were able to show, you know, get potential retailers to experience the tech and, and, sign, uh, and sign up for, for the platform. Uh, but now, as I mentioned, we have 43 stores either live or committed, right? And there are much better showcases of our technology. Like, you know, that video I showed you, I mean, that's real. There's nothing, you know, demo or stage there, right? Uh, so it doesn't make sense for us to actually have our own like zip in operated store because that's, you know, we're not a retailer and we don't want to uh, keep that going. So the lease ended, it was timely. So we just decided to close that chapter. So anybody who would like to uh, experience the stores, you can contact our crowd. We'll send you a list of active stores so you can see them. Number one, number two, if you're interested in investing in zip in simply either go to their website where there's a button that says invest with our crowd and it will lead you to one of our pages or you can go better yet to ourcrowd.com. And uh, it's pretty easy if you're not signed up already, you know, get signed up and uh, we'll uh, accommodate your investment. Uh, I wanna make one other comment if I can in terms of a little sneak preview. Uh, a lot of you are probably asking yourself, boy, this uh, Jim Scheinemann and Maven Ventures sounds like a heck of a good investment. How do I get into that fund? Well, just stay tuned because there's gonna be an opportunity coming very soon from our crowd to allow you to invest not only in Zippin, but also in, in, in funds uh, that uh, Jim and his uh, smart partners run. So uh, uh, stay tuned for that. Um, you know, you can scroll down the live page you're on now and you can click on the uh, Zippin, uh, you know, uh, uh, deal. People are already requesting the t-shirts and saying they're in, <laughs> they wanna get the list of the stores. We're gonna act on all this. Anybody who wants to write to our crowd, it's info at our crowd. You can write me too, John at our crowd. Uh, you, you know, we'll be happy to put you in touch with Christian and Jim Scheinemann. Gentlemen, I wanna thank you very, very much for being with us. I wanna thank Ellie Sheva and the entire, and Deborah and the hardworking our crowd events team. And we'll see you next time at the our crowd virtual events. Be well. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.